let's, let's get on with it here. This chapter here, um, there's, not, there's not any math in this chapter. Um, it's good and bad, though. Um, because what that means is that it requires some conceptualization, and we're going to deal with a little bit of abstractness here. Um, we're going to start looking at some things that, uh, well, to be, plum, to be honest, it's, it's going to be a little bit sort of disturbing a little bit as we get about halfway through. Um, it's going to challenge some things that uh, you thought you knew. Yeah, exactly. Um, <clears throat> so we'll, we'll see where this takes us. Well, it, it was not, I don't think that you'll argue. I don't think that it's going to challenge your core ethics or anything like that. It's just going to be one of those things where you're starting to start to question what it is that you sort of think about every day in terms of what, what your reality is and the things that you experience and that kind of stuff. So, um, All right. We're going to start talking about um, electrons. Now, up until this point, we've just mentioned electrons. Where they are, we know that they're buzzing around the center of an atom, around the nucleus of an atom. But, oh friends, we have yet to discuss but a small matter of importance when it comes to electrons. Um, basically, everything that is and every, all the reactions that we perceive is due to these electrons that are flying around. So what we're going to do is learn more than you ever wanted to learn about electrons in terms of how they are organized, how they move, how they fall, how they move from one place to another. Um, and, and see how that affects matter. Okay, um, and we'll also look at the periodic table at the very end and see how everything ties together. We sort of already looked at the periodic table. We've labeled it. You know how that kind of works. Uh, but we're going to sh show you, I'm going to show you even more um, about what you can do with the periodic table when it comes to like electrons and what it means and, and the high level of organization that's associated with uh, that table. Okay, anybody ever heard of the Hindenburg blimp and the whole Hindenburg disaster? Um, <clears throat> there was a good special on here not too long ago. Um, more like the History Channel or something about it. But um, Of course, you know this, the first statement. Okay, uh, The reason things tend to float is because uh, as long as you put a, uh, if you have something, some kind of material that's less dense than the other material that it's in, that which is less dense will rise above the thing that is more dense. Um, that's why ice floats which is weird because you've got, I'll talk about that a little bit later, but um, solid ice, water is an example of the only example on the planet in the universe that's known that the molecule in its solid form is less dense than the molecule in its liquid form. Okay? Um, if you have solid iron and you drop it into liquid iron, that iron should sink, the solid iron should sink. Uh, when you have solid water, which is ice, and you drop it in liquid water, it doesn't sink, and it's the only compound known that has that ability. We'll discuss the implications of that in a later chapter. Uh, but the Hindenburg was, of course, filled with hydrogen. Now, we know that hydrogen is an extremely flammable gas. Okay. Now, to you, it seems very ignorant that someone would fill up a giant bomb full of hydrogen and uh, you know have to use flames and, and that kind of stuff to, to, to make it work and to power it and all that kind of stuff. Why would you want to use hydrogen? Well, at the time, if you ever look into how the Hindenburg was designed, it was very, very well designed and engineered in terms of separating that hydrogen and not letting it interact uh, and that kind of stuff. So it wasn't so much that they were using hydrogen to make them float that made it explode. It had to do with uh, some other leak that eventually led to the outside burning of hydrogen. I'm not going to go into it, but you can watch the special. It's pretty good. Uh, but anyways, um, back in 1937, it killed about 36 of the 97 passengers that were on it. It was disturbing experience to, to watch and have these people retell the people that were there. Uh, but anyways, hydrogen was, my point of this story is that hydrogen is extremely flammable. And now, however, we use helium. Helium, not so flammable. Matter of fact, you could probably extinguish a flame if you use helium, submerged it in helium. Why? Why is hydrogen so flammable and helium is not? Why does hydrogen undergo the set of reactions that it undergoes, but helium does not? Regardless of what your mother says, when you suck in all those helium atoms, you don't kill brain cells. I've already discussed this, right? Um, did I not say that, how the difference between helium and like xenon, right? One's heavier, one's much lighter. But it doesn't kill brain cells. Um, it's virtually unreactive. Um, 
And we're going to answer that question. We're going to answer why things behave the way they do, why they participate in the reactions that they do, uh, why helium is unreactive, why hydrogen is so reactive. Um, so we're going to look very closely at the model of the atom. We're going to look at how the atom is arranged. Um, its protons and its neutrons make up the nucleus, but we're going to move beyond nuclear chemistry, and we're going to go out into the uh, electron part of the chemistry associated with that atom and look how they're moving around. Okay. All right. Now, <clears throat> we know this to be true already. Up there, those two things. We've already discussed that, matter and energy. Everything can be classified into matter and energy. So how do you define energy? Well, it's easiest to define matter and then say energy is everything else. Okay? Matter is everything that has mass and takes up space. Consists of molecules. Energy is all this, the effects of, that we feel and see and can witness, but yet you cannot assign mass or volume to. That would be what we call energy. Okay. Um, now, we know that matter, based upon all the, over the years, all the experiments that have been done, uh, matter is composed of particles. And now we know that these particles are called atoms. We've already just touched on that briefly. Um, but what we're going to elaborate on is when you have a collection of matter, a sample of matter, which is a collection of atoms, the properties of, of those individual little atoms, those little in individual atoms determine how this whole sample is going to behave. Okay? However those atoms behave, that's how this sample is going to behave. That's, that's what's key to understand here. Okay. Um, now, energy is not composed of particles. It instead, I want you to think of energy as being like waves, just like uh, waves that, like water waves in a pool. When you push it, you can see them ripple and you can see it go. Um, you see energy moving from one point to the next. Um, now, when I talk about energy and waves and radiation, in this chapter, we're not talking about water waves, but we are talking about waves that you can't see that are traveling through space in a similar manner. Okay, no, has no mass, anything like that. Okay, so we need to start our discussion a little bit with uh, what radiation is, what light is, uh, why we can only see certain things, why there's a whole other, you know, there's, there's the rest of the universe is happening all around us, and we only get to experience a tiny bit of it because our lights, uh, our, our eyes can only respond to certain wavelengths of radiation whenever there's all kinds of other radiation out there. Okay? All right, so again, just keep this in mind. Um, you think of the ripple effect. Think of a, a wave being propagated, started and continued, traveling from one place to the next. Um, light is going to be one form of energy. Now, I'm going to define what light is. We have in our universe electromagnetic radiation. Okay? What electromagnetic radiation is all the, is all the radiation that exists in our universe, of which light is part of. Okay? Um, well, electro ra electromagnetic radiation is radiation that is just traveling all through the universe, and it can happen in very, very, t the, the distance between the waves could be very, very, very tiny. It's like if you're standing in the ocean, some waves can come back to back really, really fast, or there could be a slow movement. It could be you know a few several seconds later before the next wave comes in. The distance between the top of this wave and the top of this wave, we can measure in what's called wavelength, the length of these waves. Okay? Sometimes the wavelength is really long. Sometimes the wavelength is really short. And what's important to understand is with all the radiation that's moving around, all these different wavelengths of energy, the ones that are really, really short in terms of the distance between their waves, the ones that have a really, really short wavelength have more power. They, are more, they possess more energy. They can hurt us more. Um, the ones that are drawn out longer, that have a bigger distance between, like humps if you were looking at it, and, and, you, and you could graph it, the, the bigger distance between these points, um, that, those waves would be lower, lower energy waves. Okay? These are going to be things, as you'll see here in a minute, like microwaves, elect, uh, tel, uh, TV antenna waves, uh, radio waves. Those kinds of things are really, really long. Then you've got, uh, you might watch Jericho, right? awesome show, can't miss it. Um, then you've got like nuclear radiation. You can't see it, but you know it does a lot of damage. It gives off t wavelength uh, energies that have wavelengths of, you know, that are really, really, really tiny. They can actually shoot right through your body. They can go in one side and out the other if they want, assuming they don't hit anything on the way. Um, so we've got all kinds of different radiation that exists, some that's really, really short wavelength, some that's really, really long wavelength, and then a really, really tiny 
window right in between. When you, when, it, when you stretch it out just long enough and get to this point, and you, the ones that are really long, if you could pull it in a little bit shorter, there's a tiny little window that exists, a minimum and a maximum, and that's the wavelength that we can see. That's the wavelength of energy that activates the rods and cones in our eyeballs that allows us to perceive our environment in the, in the sense that we call vision. We call that form of energy, it's between about what's called 400 nanometers and 700 and some nanometers. A nanometer is a billionth of a meter. So between about 400 billionths of a meter and about 700 and some billionths of a meter, there exists various waves of energy within that spectrum that create our rainbow, that create our colors that we see. Um, they, they come in, that, that they possess the, just the right amount of energy to activate our rods and cones and give us visual perception. Anything longer than 700 billionths of a meter, we never see. We don't see infrared. We don't see radio waves. If we did, the world would be a freaky place. You would die just the second that happened because it would be overstimulated. Okay? Below that, we don't see ultraviolet. Ultra means beyond, right? So the blue, I'll show you this in a second, but ultraviolet means beyond blue. Beyond the end that we can see, anything lower than that. We don't see nuclear radiation. We don't see UV radiation. It's, not, it's there, trust me. Um, but it's, we can't see it. We only experience and we can only see such a small amount of all the radiation that exists out there. Okay? And that mar amount that we can see, we call it light. Okay? But realize light is only one small chunk out of the entire spectrum that exists. Okay, <clears throat> so we tr they travel in waves. I want you to realize that every wave, this could, there's, no, it's, there's no step. There's no like, this is wave size one. This is wave size two. It's, it fades. It fades from nothing into infinitely large. It just, it's a gradual, it's sort of like, a, you ever go in, I don't know if anybody works on a computer, but you ever go into like a, where you can select your color on the computer and you want it like a custom color and you click on custom and you see this big like uh, palette of colors that are all blended together? That's what I'm talking about. There's no clear step. It's like all of a sudden the yellow has become green and you're not sure how it happened. It all kind of faded together. That's what you're going to get. That's how the wavelengths work because it's not like it goes this long and then takes a step and then goes this long. It all just kind of just eventually gets bigger and bigger and bigger and it all just melds together into our universe. Okay? Um, now, about these waves, if we can pick a, a color, for example, you'll find that red has a certain wavelength. It's attributed to a certain wavelength of energy. And I'll explain this in a second. Um, but as far as the waves in general, I want you to know a couple things about them and what it means. Um, we have wave speed. How fast are these waves traveling? Okay. We have height. We call that amplitude in the physical sciences. Okay. Is, is, realize, I could have a wave that it goes like this, and then it goes like this again, and I have a distance between these two points to get a wavelength. But I could have that same wave not go as high, but still be the same wavelength. Right? It just doesn't hump up as far. The higher that hump, the, the bigger the distance, it's sort of like if you, if you took a jump rope and I gave one, one end back to Ed and I was holding it up here and he was holding it and I just shook it every once in a while, I could get a constant wavelength between these waves. But then I could do it again, do it the same amount of times, only do it as the same quickness, but I, I can move my arm up higher and create a, the same wavelength but higher up off the ground, right? A much bigger hump. That's called the amplitude of the wave. It, it gives a, the wave a different effect. Uh, it still has the same speed, but it will have a different height. And you'll see that in terms of light, it will, that'll, that'll affect the brightness, for example. You could have a red light, but you could have a bright red light. What's the difference? If you measured the, wave, the waves associated with it, you would see that both of them have the same wavelength, but one, the hump is a lot higher if you were measuring it than the other one. That gives it more intensity. Um, so uh, length, I already talked about that, sort of like you can measure it from peak to peak. As long as you pick two equivalent points on these waves, you can start at the bottom. At the very beginning, before the wave goes up, just do that the same thing on the next wave. And it's, it's, you measure the distance between them, two equal points on the wave. Uh, and the number of wave peaks that pass in a given time. Everybody, uh, you guys use computers, right? You've heard of like uh, you, your processors in your computer, right? Say so you got a, a gigabyte processor or... Um, say you, you have a, 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 better yet, a cordless phone, and you ever, you see like, well, it used to be 900 megahertz was the big thing. Now they got like, you know, much bigger than that now. Say, it, it'll say like on the base, it'll say like 900 big M, big H, little Z, like 900 megahertz. What does that mean? 
A hertz is a cycle per second. So if you have a 900 megahertz telephone, what that means is the, the energy, the, the radiation that is traveling between your headset and your little base antenna is traveling through there. Mega means a million. 900 million waves are passing one point in one second. Okay, that's, what, that's what that measurement means. So 900 megahertz means every second, that's how many waves are passing through. In that case, 900 million, 900 megahertz. Um, so gig, gigas is another factor. Okay, so you could you know you go from giga to tera, and you can look up all those prefixes and see what, how many you know, that is equivalent to. Um, anyways, so hertz is usually how we measure this, okay, which is how many number of wave peaks pass through this point in a given amount of time, usually per second is the way we measure it. Okay, <clears throat> you've heard of this as well, right? Everyone has seen the the famous equation. Einstein's equation, right? The, the relativity equation. How does it? What's the equation? E equals m c squared. Now, I encourage you, just for fun, next time you're in the bookstore, go find a copy of his publication whereby he explains his theory, the one that he published. Open up to the first page and see how far you can read before you have no idea what he's saying. Because I assure you, it's not just you. I, I, I got. I sat down. I actually was in the bookstore and I was looking. At, I've never actually read his entire publication on the theory of relativity. I've read all the works of other people that comment on it. I've studied the uh, what the textbooks teach about it and all that. But I've never actually read Einstein's work. And I tried to one time. Can't do it. Um, <clears throat> but the point is, pages and pages and pages and pages of complex math, over and over. Just physics from the universe and math and everything, and what it boils down to, three variables. Okay? Um, now, you can't, just, you can't just make it up and say, I'm just going to pick three letters and here's the relationship and I'm going to call it a theory. He had to prove that, right? And it's, this, is, that's what, this is what I love about science. This is why I love teaching this subject. It's because there's simplicity rooted in the complexity of everything. Does that make sense? There's so much complexity out there, but yet it's so simple when you stop and look at it. And the, the, and the reverse of that is true as well. Even the most simple things, there's so many complex mechanisms that go into controlling even the most things, the things that you think are most simple. Um, here's a great example of that. E stands for energy. M stands for mass. C stands for the speed of light, in this case, squared. And what Einstein is saying is, this is why it's called relativity. Everything's relative. This is a way to unite sort of everything that's happening that we know of. We know energy, radiation. We know mass, which is matter. Okay? This is a way to take energy and matter and relate them together in one mathematical equation and unite sort of everything that's going on in the universe. Uh, that, that's, that's deep. Okay? Um, what that basically says is if you, no matter what your mass is, if you can, the closer and closer you get to the speed of light, the less mass you become and the more energy you become. And if you can ever you know, reach the speed of light, um, according to this equation, if you can ever reach a certain speed, you become pure energy and you cease to be matter. You cease to be mass at that point. Now, that's all theoretical. There's no way you can prove that, but mathematically you can. Anyway, crazy stuff. Um, so if you see C, uh, C stands for the speed of light. In chemistry, physics, it's, it doesn't change. It's always C. Um, the speed of light, in other words, we, we call it the speed of light because that's what we can measure in terms of what we see. We see light. But realize that's actually the speed of electromagnetic radiation. Of all the energy that's out there that's traveling through the universe, 3 times 10 to the 8th meters per second. Let's put it in perspective. That's 186,000 miles per second. What does that mean? That means if you turned on a flashlight beam, or let's say you had the world's biggest lightsaber, okay, and you turned it on, it could wrap around the world and meet back on itself in one-seventh of a second. Okay, that's how fast this stuff is traveling. Um, it's hard for people to comprehend that, but it's, it's very, 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 very fast. Okay, so all types of light energy are going to travel at the same speed. Okay? Now, I talked about amplitude. Amplitude is how high that, that wave goes. Okay? Um, it is a measure of the intensity of the wave. In other words, when you're dealing with light, it'll have to do with the brightness. The brighter the light... Um, the, the higher the amplitude of that wave coming off that light. Okay, 
<coughs> wavelength. We symbolize that with the letter lambda. Think of anybody watch Revenge of the Nerds? Remember that? La- lambda, lambda, lambda. The tri Um The distance between crests, okay, is a wavelength. Um, we generally measure this in nanometers, one, which is one times ten to the minus nine meters. In other words, one billionth of a meter. Okay. Uh, sometimes you might see books that measure it in one times ten to the minus tenth meters, and they call that angstrom. But we won't. We won't deal with that. We'll stick with nanometers. Um, now, the wavelength of that small little portion that I talk about light, right? It's sort of like everything way over here, we, we weed out. Everything above that, we weed out. But this small little sets of wavelength in between, we call visible light. Uh, what makes different colors? Okay. Well, each color has its own sort of wavelength, or at least little boundary in which, in which it, uh, it operates, a little wavelength boundary. If you're anything like me, I, I, everyone's probably, I, I know a ton of people have asked this question before, right, as you're thinking. What if, you know, I see yellow, but it's not actually the same color that someone else has seen, but they learned it as yellow, so they call it yellow. You know, you know what I'm talking about? Anyone ever thought that? Um, well, well, we're not going to, you're right, we're not going to see the exact same thing, but you know, in, a, in, a, uh, in a bigger picture, I mean, what is, you know, people will, will take that farther and say, what if, like, I look at her shirt and I see the color that I say that I, I call yellow. And uh, what if, you know, when Michelle looks at that shirt, she calls that yellow, but really, if I could see through her eyes, it would be green to me. You know what I mean? Anyways, not important. Um, my point is that colors can be attributed to certain wavelengths. So there is a way to measure and quantify and say this is green and this is yellow across the board for everyone so that we know that, that things like that don't happen. Um, and we can measure the wavelength of the light coming off something that is pink or yellow or red or whatever. Um, and, and you'll see that certain colors fall within s- certain wavelengths that are attributed to them. Um, we call this the color spectrum. Uh, why is a, a red shirt red? It's the reason that a red shirt is red is because there's a lot of radiation all around us. It's hitting us all the time. Whether you like that or not, as you sit here, there's cosmic radiation. There's radiation that's really, really tiny, really, really long. We got cell phones. People got cell phones in here. You think there ain't radiation coming off of that? You're crazy. Um, <clears throat> it's, it's all around us. This computer, that camera up there, uh, this little thing with the battery in it, there's radiation everywhere. Not that that should freak you out. We're all going to die or anything. Um, but it's everywhere. <clears throat> um, but why is our red shirt red? Is because some of that radiation is within this little between falls within a wavelength between 400 and 700 meters. It's going to be light radiation. It's going to be hitting, bouncing off of our clothing. Okay? Now, in our clothing are dyes, right? certain chemicals that are made to absorb energy and release energy. All chemicals do this. I'm going to show you what happens as a result of some of these chemicals in a minute. Um, but, like for example, this is a multicolor, but something that's a pink or a, her shirt's orange, yours is yellow. Um, it's like solid colors especially can be made of all of like one type of, of blend of chemicals that what they do is absorb all of the radiation, well, at least the light radiation, okay? I don't know, everything else is irrelevant because we don't see it anyways. It's absorbing all of, the, all of the radiation within the light spectrum except for certain wavelengths that it reflects back, okay? That's what we see. We see whatever radiation is reflected off of these. What it, some, of it, some of the energy is absorbed by these chemicals, some of it isn't absorbed, and it's bounced back, or it's released by these chemicals, and it comes back, and we, we see what is reflected off. And it channels, it makes its way into our eyeballs, it goes back to our rods and cones, back in our retina, the very back of our eyeball, and that energy then is absorbed, whatever wavelength that is, is absorbed by certain um, um, amounts of the rods and cones in our eye, and they get excited, cells start activating, it sends an impulse, and we perceive that as a, a, a vision. Uh, we, we, we see Okay? Now realize, this is, what's, this is what blows your, can really blow your mind. You don't need your eyes to see. What you need is your brain to see. Um, if I could stimulate those same optic nerve anywhere along that path, as long as I could stimulate those same nerves, you would have visions in your head. Close your eyes. Think of a picture. You can get a picture in your head. Did you need to see it? Did your eyes need to be open to see that? No. You can get a very detailed picture of a lot of things without ever having to actually see them. So what is sight? What is vision? It's, it's, it's a, a figment of your brain is what it is. 
you use radiation and you interpret radiation to send nerve impulses that then fire to your brain and then they fire everywhere else to form these little synaptic connections that we call memories. It's so transient, so fleeting, but it's there. Um, it's really a lot to think about. It really it kind of messes you up if you think about it too long. Um, there's, a lot of res- there's some new research out there now. It started a few years ago. They're starting to develop it more where you can take a chip, put it in your, uh, it's for blind people or people that have vision problems, put it on your tongue, put a little camera on some glasses, let them walk around, and that camera feed will go down into the microchip that's in their tongue and tap into the same nerve channels that where, they, where they can meet, and they can actually stimulate the tongue to end up stimulating the same region of the brain and allow those people to see images in their brain through their tongue and through, the, through that camera as opposed to just using your eyes. Okay? Um, crazy stuff. Now, it's not, mu- it's not perfect. They don't see like we see. Um, but it, the goal of it is not to let them see like we see, but to see, let them you know, see a car coming, see a door somewhere, to help them just navigate generally in life, which would be a huge change. Uh, I don't know. I don't know. I, probably I would guess it, for, it just depends on, uh, I guess, the type of camera they use and how many nerve pathways they elicit. I don't know. Um, anyways, it's, it's pretty neat stuff. But everything is really sort of not like you think it is. Okay? Uh, we walk around in this little bubble, and, and we, um, we sort of define our own parameters of logic. We say this is the way it's got to be, and so we're going to make up these boundaries and study within them. We do that to ourselves. Um, anyways. All right, we've got frequency. Okay, frequency, I, I talked about like in Hertz a while ago, how many, point, how many waves pass through a given point in a certain amount of time? How frequent do they, frequently do they come? That kind of thing. Okay, um, so there we've got wavelengths. Just to give you a visual here. We call this the crest and this the trough. Um, <clears throat> notice I want you to realize something here so that you can answer some questions. Um, it says the shorter the, what does this stand for? Remember, that's lambda. Huh? Wavelength. The shorter the wavelength, the higher the frequency. Okay, you can think of velocity, but we're talking about frequency, how, how frequently they come through that area. So the shorter the wavelength, the higher the frequency. That makes sense if you think about it. Okay? You can see this, that the shorter the distance between these waves, obviously the more of those waves that can pass through a given amount of time. Okay? So the shorter the wavelength, the higher the frequency. Notice it doesn't matter if I measure from the beginning to the beginning or the top to the top as long as there are equal points on both waves. Okay. All right. Now, here's where it gets really crazy. Guys like Maxwell and Planck and Einstein, you, you, know, you guys know who Larry Bird and Michael Jordan is, but you don't know the guys that changed the face of the universe and changed how we study science. You heard of Einstein, but these other guys I'm going to tell you about coming up here these are people that everybody should know. These are like the jerseys that you should be wearing, not these sports stars. I'm telling you that right now. <laughs> Peyton Manning, no way. I want Max Planck. <laughs> All right. <laughs> now, <laughs> I have a Godro. His number is 6.02 <laughs> times 7 to the 23rd. Um, anyways, the, some things about light. Now, here's what screwed everybody up, because when they, this wave thing, everybody bought it, okay? But there was something, especially Einstein, because he used, sort of used his scientific cloud at this point to help push this theory when people started to develop it. Um, there came to be a, a, a new theory out there called the, uh, the, a new effect called the photoelectric effect. Um, basically, what they found, which was, which was really screwy, was that light had the ability to not only act as energy, as a waveform, it also had the ability to behave very similarly to matter. Now, this is crazy. Okay? It, it, it doesn't make any sense because all the other radiation acted like radiation, and, and light is just one little piece of the, of the radiation spectrum, and it certainly behaves like radiation, but they found that it also sometimes behaved like particles, like little, little particles that got shot through space. And this didn't make any sense. Um, and it really, ch- I mean, imagine this. Uh, we get stuck in a paradigm of thought. We, we, we have these little things that we operate under, and, and we have these things that we accept as truths. Um, like right now, for example, no one really would, intelligently anyways, argue with me that the world is flat. Okay? We, it, it just seems stupid now. 
There was a time when it wasn't so stupid. And not only that, no one would argue at this point that the Earth is not the center of our solar system because the moon travels around us, but there's obviously tons of data that suggests now that the Earth travels around in a circle and the sun stays still. The heliocentric model of the, of, the unit, of the solar system, that the sun stays still. Now, when that first came out back in the 1600s, 1700s, you know, spent back in that, when Galileo, Copernicus and Galileo was around, um, and you might learn about this in your history classes, but this was huge whenever this guy had the guts to stand up against accepted doctrine in church and say, you know what? Your interpretation of, of what you believe is wrong. It's, it, it's not that everything about it is wrong, but you're looking at it wrong because I'm saying that we don't have to be the center of the solar system to still be the pinnacle of creation or whatever they were talking about with, with the church. Um, and then, of course, that challenged everybody. Everybody got mad and said, this is bull crap, and, and, and what you're going to do is challenge our whole entire infrastructure, and everything's going to collapse if, if we let this guy do this. But now, you know, anybody who's you know, part of the faith community certainly has no problem accepting that the sun is the center of the universe. It doesn't make any difference to us at all. I'll just leave that one to go. I wanted to go somewhere with this one. Okay, and you can probably imagine where I'm going with this one, but I'll leave it. Um, I was going to go more towards a biological perspective. Um, anyways, um, it's interesting. And uh, it, it, these are big moments in history where things change. Um, and among the scientific community, this was one of those times when all of a sudden we thought we had it figured out, we were comfortable. And all of a sudden, science makes us uncomfortable. Science is real good at that these days, making us uncomfortable with the things that we think about, especially with all the stem cell research and everything and everything like that. Um, anyways, Max Planck and Albert Einstein labeled things called photons, which are little packets of light energy. Now, they are, here's what's interesting. They are still waves. They are, they are little fragments of waves, so they still act like radiation. But since they are little fragments, they're little packets, and they call little bundles photons. So these little bundles sort of act like matter, which is really weird. Um, so you think of them as like light packets of energy. Now, each wavelength of light, whatever wavelength that we're talking about here within this little window of light, um, each wavelength of light has photons that have a different amount of energy. That makes sense, right? Because each wavelength of light is going to have a different frequency. It's going to have a different wavelength. And remember I said that the sh what they found was shorter wavelengths of light actually packed more punch. Um, the, they, they have more energy than the longer wavelengths of light. All right, so we said the longer the wavelength, the lower the energy of the photons. I say think about the beach. Um, if you think about waves coming in, and assuming the waves are the same size, okay, and you wait out about you know, 10 feet out off the shoreline, uh, you're sitting here, and waves are coming in. Okay? The wavelength is very long. Let's we'll say there's a, a long time. One comes up, and the crest for the one behind it is, is another 30 yards out. So there's a long delay between those. It's a lot easier to stand there and not get pushed over. Say you're up to your waist and you're walking out there and the wavelength is very low, okay? It's a very long distance between subsequent waves. Uh, it's a lot easier to stand there and not get pushed over. If those waves increased, okay, and the wavelength got shorter, you, it's much, much harder. It's bringing more force. It's much harder to stand up in that situation and it's easier to fall down. Um, think of it sort of in those terms. The longer the wavelength, the less energy that it possesses. The closer together those waves are, the more, the more punch these, these guys are gonna pack whenever they're flying through the universe. Okay, now I want to show you something. Some of you might have these little prisms, right, that you hang in the kitchen by the sink, and it, it makes a ooh, pretty rainbow. Um, <laughs> you uh, see a rainbow in the sky, or you look in a, a, a puddle with you know, oil in it. It's a beautiful thing, right? And you got little uh, rainbow colors on the oil puddle there. Um, you know, what, what's going on here? Why do you have all these rain, this rainbow array of colors? Uh, what you should see is the same pattern of colors as well every single time if you could spread these things out. Um, you guys learned probably in elementary school the whole Roy G. Biv thing, right? Red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet. Um, <clears throat> you probably didn't understand at the time what it is you were learning. You were actually learning the order of wavelengths of different colors is what you were learning. Uh, if you take white light, white light, covers the entire spectrum of visible light. It's everything in there mixed together. Nothing filtered out. It's everything together. That's white light. Um, not so much this. These are fluorescent lights. But um, a light bulb, an incandescent light bulb, the sunshine outside, whatever. If we could collect that, 
I, pa- I say pass it through a slit here just to sort of funnel it, to kind of point it in one direction so it doesn't go everywhere. Um, focus it into a beam and pass it through a prism. Here's what it's like. What you got to um, Violet, what you're going to see is violet into the spectrum are the really, really tiny wavelengths, okay, the really short, powerful ones. The red end of the spectrum, as you go higher and higher, this is longer wavelengths that are going to be sort of the reddish end of the spectrum in terms of what color they will produce. Now, before I show you the, the big spectrum, just keep this in mind. The way you can think about this, why, when you pass light through a prism, why does it separate out into all the different wavelengths? Why does it fan it out? It's sort of like taking a deck of cards and just fanning them all out, spreading out all the cards from one another. Why does, why does it do this? Well, this is a different density of air, than air, right? This is a prism. Um, light can pass through it, but when it does pass through it, it's sort of like you running down the hallway, and all of a sudden as you're running, you hit this plasma screen in front of you. You don't see it. It's just there. It's like a little weird hole in space, and you hit it, and all of a sudden you're just running, you're running real slow. Okay, you can't run through air. Or you can't run through plasma like you can through air. It slows you down. Light does the same thing. Okay, now, why is it doing this? Well, the way this is arranged, without going into the physics of optics, it's going to cause light to bend uh, when it comes in. And the reason is sort of like, uh, without getting too much to it, is like a, say you got a real sharp curve on the road. It's a 90 degree turn. Okay, you're going, it doesn't matter how fast you're going. Um, <clears throat> you're going a given speed. One of us is driving a Volkswagen Bug or Beetle, whatever they're called. And the other one's driving a semi-tractor trailer. Okay. One of us is making that turn, and one of us ain't if we're going 40 mile an hour. Okay? Well, probably both, neither one of us are if we're going 40, but let's say 25, 30 mile an hour. Uh, one of us is making it, unless you're, uh, you, can, you can you know tilt the whole rig up on two, one side. And I don't know, but um, <clears throat> one of us is making it, one of us isn't. But in any case, uh, even if we slow down to the minimum speed for each of us, like if the bug slowed down to the minimum speed that it could take the turn, and the semi slowed down to the minimum speed that it could take the turn. Uh, what you will see is obviously the smaller the car, the less momentum, right? It can hug that corner a lot tighter, make that turn a lot sharper. The things that are heavier are farther out to the side. They're kind of be dragging around the end because they have more momentum, right? Think of the same thing with light. These guys want to bend as they come through here. Who's going to bend the easiest? The thing that's smaller, the thing that's shorter, right? This is a shorter wavelength. It's tighter. It can take that turn more easily. It's going to turn, and then it's going to weed them out, and it's going to fan them out. You can think of it in terms of momentum. It's going to fan it out according to size of the wavelength, and that's exactly what happens. So you get this spread of the spectrum. You start separating out different wavelengths. Okay, and this is what you'll see with white light. You can see that there's a whole bunch of When Newton was discovering all this, Isaac Newton, um, a little bit of a, an eccentric, but he would have uh, like whole, like, his, his whole uh, place where he was living covered up, and he'd have little holes where light could come in. He had stuff hanging from the ceiling, spots on the wall where he was marking. He'd have different mirrors, and he'd have different prisms and all kinds of stuff. Fanned it all out, marked where all the colors were, all kinds of cool stuff. Um, somebody had to start figuring this out. Uh, but you can really, you know, you can see this. I mean, someone, we, we, this is the difference between people who are great scientific minds and the rest of us. I'm not saying you're not. I'll speak for myself. Um, you know, you, we look at a, a prism, and we say, Oh, that's pretty. Whereas someone like Newton would say, oh, holy crap, what, what causes that? Why does this happen? I, this is beautiful, but what's even more beautiful is probably how it actually happens. Let's look at the math behind it. Let's look at how the universe works. Neat thing about Newton is he was actually a very religious man. So he was not going against the church doctrine. He was trying to, think, he was trying to see his creator within all of the works that he studied. That was what was really cool about it. Um, anyways, um, <clears throat> We call this a continuous spectrum. Okay? We said the color is determined by its wavelength. Um, now, realize that there are wavelengths given off of energy all around us that are not within that visible spectrum that we cannot see. Okay? Uh, some animals have sensors that can get activated. You've, you, know, you know that some pit vipers right, have inf- can see in infrared. We call it seeing. It's not really seeing. It, you can mental image it. Right? They don't see it with their eyes. Uh, you call it like you know, like third eye in the middle of their head kind of thing. Um, but it's really not an eye at all. It's just a, a special collection of cells that can get excited by certain wavelengths of energy. 
And when it does, it stimulates their brain. And it's like I told you a minute ago, when you close your eyes, you can still see perceptions of things in your brain. Sort of the same thing. They don't necessarily see probably like they could with their eyes, but they can certainly get areas in their visual cortex excited to the point where they can see images and, they, and, and uh, more concentrated where there's more heat and longer wavelengths. Okay? Um, <clears throat> so don't worry about this. I'm going to explain this much easier on the next picture. Okay? Um, but like here, if you were looking at infrared, um, <clears throat> like night vision goggles and that kind of stuff, how all of that works, okay? um, it will take, you, know, you, can, you can take energy coming off of something chemically convert, use chemicals to absorb some and get it back within the visible range. It can take, you know, infrared, you can key in on those infrared waves, collect them with certain atoms and molecules that then re-release those waves within the visible spectrum. Does that make sense? You can actually collect things that are longer, compress them, get them back into the visible range, and you can see things. That's crazy. That's, that's weird to think about. Um, but we've all seen images sort of similar to this, right, where we've, we've seen these infrared. Um, Okay, and you think about these reds and these yellows, obviously there's more heat associated with the red regions. It's a longer wavelength. Red's a longer wavelength than yellow. Okay, okay. what do all these numbers mean? It means this. Okay, um, I said that you could start really, really tiny in terms of waves, and you could just string out and get waves that are really, really long. You could fall anywhere in between all of these. These just represent the minimum and the maximum that we know of. There's probably smaller ones, there's probably bigger ones, but this is all that we can measure. Um, notice, 1 times 10 to the minus 15, how small that wavelength actually is. What is associated with that? Sun, the stars, uh, radioactive atoms. These are things that are so powerful, so small, could be so dangerous, but yet are you know, so amazing all in the same, all in the same sense. Um, these are extremely high energy radiation. Okay? You'll see things down here. Um, about a, a hundred times uh, star explosions, supernovas, that a um, ridiculous amount of energy that these things can give off. Um, then getting a little bit longer, remember as we go from exponents, these are negative exponents, so as they get smaller, the number actually gets bigger, right? So as we're coming this way, we start to see ultraviolet, beyond violet. It's just outside of what we see as violet. This is stuff that's coming from the, from the sun, uh, from that kind of thing. Um, ultraviolet light, this stuff has the ability right here to shoot right, actually this stuff has the ability to just obliterate us, just come right through us and, and separate our matter. Um, this stuff over here, x-rays, look how high frequency x-rays are. They're down there, we don't see those. Um, it's obviously dangerous to sit in front of an x-ray machine and just click the button. Because what you got to realize is x-rays have the ability to pass in one side of us and out the other side of our body. Okay. Um, now, we are mostly empty space. I mentioned this before, right? I said that if you took a golf ball and put it in the middle of a 50-yard line, that would be the nucleus, and the size of the entire stadium would be about the size of the entire atom. So chances are, if wavelengths of energy are passing through us, they're going to miss it. They're going to miss something. They're going to fit. These wavelengths are really, really small. They can actually fit between atoms, in, in between electrons and atoms and that kind of thing. So as these things are, are going through there, mostly they're going to hit empty space, okay? Um, not always. That's why whenever you do uh, stand out in the sun or you go to the tanning beds or all that kind of stuff, most of the time you're right, nothing's going to happen to you, usually, if you're going to play the statistics, because most of the time radiation is going to pass through and it's not going to hit anything, and let alone hit your DNA that's inside your cells. It fits through all these tiny places. However, um, <clears throat> the more that you do it, obviously the more chances you are giving for that radiation to hit something more vulnerable. And the second that it does, you mutate the DNA, that cell goes haywire, all of a sudden you've induced cancer within your cell. Okay? Um, now there's a lot of things that can do that. I'm just saying that you know, a lot of things have been proven to do that, but you are playing a, you're rolling the dice. Okay? It's a crapshoot. Um, <clears throat> all right. Now, as far as uh, visible light, ultraviolet radiation, some butterflies have been, um, it's, some research suggests that butterflies are able to perceive some forms of UV radiation. Um, they're able to process it sort of relatively visually sort of like how vi pit vipers can, can see in infrared. Um, <clears throat> the uh, visible light spectrum then, notice how small of a window that is compared to all the radiation that's out there. We don't see only but a fraction of everything that's happening all around us at any given point. And should there ever be an organism more sophisticated than us, should there be a power higher than us, my guess is that they can see far beyond 
all of this visible light spectrum. In which case, in all in every sense of the word, see more than what we can see. Okay. Um, <clears throat> all right. Infrared radiation is beyond the red. Okay. This is like the we give off the energy that we give off of our bodies, the heat that you feel given off. If you measured the wavelength of the energy coming off of our body, that radiation, it falls in this region right here, the infrared region. That's how come some biological organisms are adapted to respond to that. They can hunt that. They, uh, they, can, they can perceive temperatures um, in other animals and that kind of stuff, of the energy given off of them. Microwaves, um, radar, uh, microwave ovens, all this over here, these are much longer waves beyond what we can see. Uh, radio waves are even bigger. Cell phone, radio, TV waves, all that kind of stuff. This is much, much bigger stuff. Um, anyways, it's, it's really neat to think about. All right, now, see if you can answer this without looking. Don't look at your uh, notes here. I want you to consider these. Microwaves, gamma rays, green light, red light. It's like playing with my daughter. Red light, green light. Green light, red light, ultraviolet light. I want you to classify them, put them in order by, of wavelength by short to long. In other words, up there, which has the shortest wavelength of the ones that you see? Gamma rays. What's next? Okay, what's next? Green, then red, then microwaves. Okay, so be able to do that. By frequency. Okay, so what does that mean? The shorter the wavelength the higher the frequency, right? So if you've got something that's really, really short, like in this case, gamma rays, gamma rays have extremely high frequency. They are high frequency waves. So I want to go from low to high. What's the lowest frequency that you see up there? Microwaves. Then what? Then what? Then, good. Then gamma rays, okay? So we went from low to high. By energy, I want the lowest energy to the most energy. Of those up there, what possesses the least amount of energy? Good. What possesses the most amount of energy? Gamma rays. I didn't go in order that time. I skipped to the end. Okay. Gamma rays possess the most amount of energy. Okay. Take Chem 2, and we'll talk about nuclear reactions and, and why gamma rays are given off and all that bad stuff. <laughs> uh, come on, people. <laughs> is that what it is? Yeah. Uh, all right, now, we've all seen what we call neon lights before, okay? But the problem is, it's all not neon. We call them neon lights, but most of them actually are not even, they're not made of neon. Um, neon is used sometimes. What are they? How do they work? And what in the world does it have to do with anything we're talking about, okay? Now, I want you to understand something. If I have an atom. Okay. I can take an atom and I can supply energy to it. I can use an electric current to deliver energy to it. I can put it in the sun and let UV rays bombard it. I can just let other forms of radiation bombard it. In either case, this atom is in a position to do one of two things. Either reflect and bounce off any radiation that hits it, absorb all of the radiation that hits it, or do a combination of both. Um, that's what this atom has to deal with. Atoms can acquire extra energy. They can do this. But they must eventually release it. The law of the conservation of, of anything, mass, energy, it has to be accounted for. It doesn't just go somewhere. It doesn't disappear. It's not created. You have to be able to account for it. And what atoms can do is absorb energy, and what they're going to do then is re-release that energy. And when they re-release that energy, it does something for us okay, that we can see. When atoms emit energy, it always is released in the form of light. Now, <clears throat> when you get into nuclear explosions, atoms are releasing energy that have more than just light. You never see the invisible nuclear explosion, I assure you. Okay? Um, so there's tons of light that's given off from a nuclear explosion. But there's also a ton of other, like gamma rays and everything else that's going to be coming off of this. Um, but one thing that is always true is the atoms will always give off some radiation that falls within our visible light spectrum that we can see. Okay? Now, it may be faint. We may not be able to pick up on it. But especially if it's like white light, that we, you know, and it's not that intense, 
but there's always some radiation that is going to be given off as they absorb energy. Okay? Take a look at these neon signs. That color that you see there is sort of that orangish yellow color is actually neon gas pumped in there. My question is this, though. Neon is what, on the, according to the periodic table? What do we classify it as? A noble gas. What can you tell me about noble gases? They don't react. Okay, they're gases and they don't react. They're virtually unreactive anyways. So how does this happen? How can neon glow if it doesn't react with anything? Okay, but why? How does it work? That's what I'm going to teach you. Because I said so. That's all that matters. Right? No, not the way it works. This blue color that you see, like on the cafe here and in this tube, I should have brought in some of these tubes. I have some spectral tubes that uh, I can bring in with different colors of different elements that, that you can light up different colors. Um, hydrogen is sort of like a pink color, um, or like a, a real dull orangish pink color. Mercury is a pretty blue color. Um, the Part of the reason, argon is what you have up here in fluorescent lights. You ever take a, a, a fluorescent light tube and let it bu uh, bust or whatever? It's got filled with gas. It explodes. Um, I'll explain exactly how they, they work here in a second when I do something else, but I realize that the main gas that's in here is argon, which is a pretty large component of our, our environment. It's an inert, noble gas. It doesn't react. Um, but argon sort of gives off a, a, a wavelength similar to white light, sort of all of them together. It's, a, it's not exactly white light. If you ever have fluorescent lights in your house, you know that it's not the same as a real light bulb, but it's close. Um, and it tends to have sort of only be a little bluer twinge to it. Tinge, whatever the word is, not twin. A little bluer uh, color to it, as a little bluish type of light. Um, and the reason is because there's going to be mercury in this, and I'll explain a little bit later as to why that mercury is there. Okay, um, now, atoms do not, however, they do not emit all colors. What's really, really cool is that each atom that exists on the periodic table will emit different wavelengths of light. There are fingerprints that you can take for all the atoms that we know. Their fingerprints is called their spectral analysis. In other words, what wavelengths do they emit and what ones do they absorb? Okay? Um, and if you know that, you can identify what different atoms are. I'll show you what I mean. If you take hydrogen, if I had one of these lamps that was filled with hydrogen gas, that's all that was in it. It was a vacuum with nothing but hydrogen in it, and I supplied an electric current. What I could do is cause those um, to glow. I could cause those atoms to glow. Now, when they glow, they're going to give off a certain color, right? You're going to see that color. Now, if we do the same thing that we did before with white light, with white light, when we put it through this slit, put it through a prism, it fanned out all the colors of the visible spectrum. For hydrogen, what you will find is that's not the case. It will come through this slit, pass through the prism, and it will fan out but you'll see that all the wavelengths are not there like they were before. So if I put a piece of film back here to collect that, that gets excited from, from light, just like photography film, that kind of stuff, if I set up a piece of film and I let this pass through and I let this light sort of, quote, burn hole, not really burning, but burn holes in this film at those spots where it lands, you'll see that every single time I do that, I'll have the exact same lines in the exact same places for hydrogen. Okay? Notice there's only about four lines that you see here. Not a whole big spread of lines at all, infinite number of lines that run together like we have with white light. This is the fingerprint for hydrogen. Now, when they found this, the scientists in them say, whoa, why does this happen? Why does hydrogen only emit certain wavelengths of light? How can we explain this? What about an atom possibly can explain what's going on here? Not the protons, not the neutrons. It doesn't make any sense. It's got to be the electrons. And if it's the electrons, how in the world can we explain this? Okay. Now, <clears throat> here's a white light spectrum. Like I said, everything runs together. Take a look at hydrogen. This is all you see. You only see this wavelength, this wavelength, and this wavelength being emitted. For helium, it's even different. For neon, there's a lot more. But it's nowhere near the spectrum that you see up with white light. If you do all the elements on the table, you'll get a different one for each element. It will never be the same. Okay? So why do atoms only emit certain wavelengths? That's the question. That's the question of the century. Okay? Um, 
<clears throat> now, one thing before I go into that, I want to I want to be able for you to understand the reverse of this. We have what's called an emission spectrum, which is what you just saw. Okay, uh, but the opposite of that would be what's called an absorption spectrum. Whatever something emits, it absorbs everything else. Okay, whatever it absorbs, it emits everything else. So it would make sense then. Here's what we did a second ago. We took an electrical source right here. We took that hydrogen tube. We, we uh, put it through this slit, refracted it through that prism, and we had different lines hit on that film back there. It got spread out. Another thing you could do is just take white light that has all the wavelengths present, pass it through a slit, and before you get to the prism, stick a hydrogen tube in front of it so that the hydrogen tube is not glowing and not giving off all of that, but it's, it's absorbing energy from that white light. When it does, what, it, what you should get is something like this. It should absorb everything from that white light except for the things that it emits, which are these little holes that you see that correspond to the emission spectrum if we just let hydrogen shine by itself. That's the point of this. Okay? So you can do it either way. You can look at an absorption spectrum or an emission spectrum. The lines should line up the same. Okay? Notice these are actually numbers. Those correspond to, what do you think? Wavelengths. Okay, there are actually specific measured wavelengths given off by hydrogen atoms. This is one of the reasons why we've never been to some of these planets out there, but yet we can get a good idea of what makes up their atmosphere. Okay? How can we never have landed on Neptune, but yet can fathom what is there in terms of its environment, what elements are present, and that kind of stuff? Well, if you take, especially from outer space, like with the Hubble telescope and that kind of stuff, and you can take shots and capture light reflecting off the surface of these planets, and you fan out the spectrum, you can figure out what elements, you know, what wavelengths are there, and thus what elements are probably indicative of those wavelengths and that kind of stuff. Um, now, it's not foolproof, it's not perfect, but you can certainly see that what you shouldn't say is, well, we've never been there, so we don't know, and it's all a bunch of crap. Well, that doesn't make any sense, because you could see the perfect theory behind this, and now realize there are shortcomings to it, certainly. It's not foolproof. There's a lot of things that could happen in between. But it certainly should, should deserve some credit in your eyes. It, it should, it, you should realize that it is based upon sound logic. Okay? All right. So this whole rebirth of all these things came up with a new model of the atom. Still leaving protons and neutrons um, where they are. Still leaving electrons sort of buzzing around, but in a much more sophisticated manner. Okay? So this is called the Bohr theory of the atom. Now, what happened was the nuclear model of the atom that we, had, we have heretofore discussed with, with protons and neutrons, with electrons buzzing around, what that does not explain, it does not explain how the atom can gain or lose energy. In other words, produce these wavelengths that we see, with all of which have a different energy associated with them. This doesn't explain anything, so there had to be another way, a better explanation of how the atom works. So... He developed a model to explain how the structure of the atom changes when it undergoes energy transitions. What does that mean to you? Okay, that means we can take something now and quantize it. In other words, um, we can, based upon where the electron is in the atom, if here's the center, is it close to the center? Is it far away? Where it's at in the atom, we can assign a number value to it, measure it, and keep track of energy changes associated with changing numbers. I'll show you what I mean. Okay. <clears throat> Take a look at this. Now remember, what he worked with, because this is going to change in a minute, what he worked with was hydrogen. He only worked with hydrogen, so that's all we're talking about here. We can't apply it to everything else yet. <clears throat> what he basically said was, okay, I have a nucleus, protons and, elect or protons and neutrons. I have flying around it in different levels, Electrons. Now, in the case of hydrogen, I've just got one electron buzzing around out there somewhere. It's sort of like the planets around the sun. It's held there by gravitational force, but it stays farther away from the center because it's buzzing around with a, with a velocity, spinning around, sort of like a centripetal force kind of thing. Um, so it's there. It's being held in with uh, opposites attract kind of thing and gravity. Um, but it can get farther away at certain points, and it can get closer to the nucleus at certain points. That certainly makes sense, right? There's no reason that that shouldn't be true. Um, if, you know, even if I just put a dot on the floor and had you run around it a thousand times, if I froze time every fraction of a second and marked a dot everywhere you were, you're never going to be in a perfect circle and a perfect line the whole time. You're going to vary. It's going to get a little closer. It's going to get a little farther away. 
No difference here with the electron and the atom, so he says. What he's also going to say is, basically, these electrons travel around um, not like in orbits, not flat. Like if you have this, it doesn't just loop around like it's sitting on a plate. It actually says that, okay, here's my nucleus. I'm going to take like a ball or like, a, like a, an egg, but it'll be a sphere, and I'm going to encapsulate that nucleus. And by encapsulating this nucleus, I've created a boundary that that electron cannot get out of. Does that make sense? So what he's saying is there's a boundary that fixates this electron in terms of how far away from the nucleus it can get. But it can go anywhere within that boundary. It can get right up next to the nucleus. It can shoot way down here, shoot way up here, but it can't go past the set boundary. Okay, that's what he's saying. He calls these um, like shells as opposed to, or like layers and shells as opposed to specific orbits that are flat where you just spin around. Okay? All right, and what he's also saying is the farther the electron is away from the nucleus, the more energy it will possess. Now let's relate this to real life. Say I want to smack one of you. Okay? Not that I would, of course, just that I might feel like it sometime. <laughs> Say I take a golf ball and I tie a little string to it, and the string's about that long. And I twirl it around as fast as I can, and I walk up the land on the side of her head and I smack it. It'll probably hurt, right? Which would hurt more? That, or if I took about a string about that long, tied the golf ball on, and just started swinging it as hard as I could. And then I clocked her in the head with it. Probably that's going to hold more energy, right? Why wouldn't that be true with an electron? Okay? If you think about the physics behind this, and it's spinning, and it's spinning, the farther away this electron gets from the nucleus, the more energy is associated with it as it's moving around. So what Bohr is saying is, as these things get up here, the electron has more energy than what it does when it's way down here. It possesses more energy. So now we start to see the possibility of how, when it moves from one place to another, what do you know about energy? We have to conserve it, right? It has to be accounted for. So if it starts out here and it comes down here, what has to happen? Energy has to be released. Energy has to go somewhere. If, if energy is absorbed and it comes into the atom, it has to be accounted for, what happens? That electron can bounce up higher, so it can hold more energy. Up here, it can hold more energy than it can down here, right? As soon as it absorbs that energy, what can happen? It can fall right back down and release energy. Guess what it's going to release it as? Light, okay? That's what happens in, in all of these cases. Now, he found this to be true with hydrogen. Um, notice he's quantized this. He's put numbers to it. He calls this first level N equals 1, N equals 2, 3, 4, 5, just different layers away from the nucleus. You'll see that they get progressively closer, too, in terms of you know, at one, there's a big distance between 1 and 2, a little smaller distance between 2 and 3, so on and so forth. Each orbit, each one of these layers that you see that represents a distance from the nucleus, has a specific amount of energy. Okay? We call this the quantum, no, uh, quantum number, n equals 1. The second orbital is n equals 2, uh, the, second, uh, the second layer or whatever. That's what we're talking about here. Now. This is something fun. Anybody remember the Scott Bakula was in that show, Quantum Leap? Anybody remember that? I'm, I'm dating myself a little bit probably, but I mean, it's, it's a good show. Um, <laughs> oh, is it? I, I haven't seen it in a long time. I haven't seen it in a long time. Um, where did that name come from? Now check this out. Okay. Now, this is, this is, we're getting into the good stuff now. When an atom gains energy, this is what's been proven to be true. They've, they've, they've documented this. They've seen this happen. When the atom gains energy, the electron leaps from a lower energy orbit to one that's farther from the nucleus. So it can absorb that energy. Um, it has to go somewhere. It can't stay where it's at and, and, and hold that energy. If it's going to hold that energy, it's got to go up to a place where it can, it can possess more energy. Okay? All right. Now, however, this is what's freaky. However, during that quantum leap, Okay, quantum leap is where this electron moves from one place to another. It doesn't travel through the space between the orbits. It just disappears in the lower orbit and then all of a sudden appears in the higher orbit. No one can explain why this happens. No one can explain where this electron goes. Okay? Does it go to another dimension? Does it go to another universe? You laugh, but what other explanation is there? This thing, we, we know that energy doesn't just disappear and reappear. 
But these quantum leaps happen. And when this electron moves from a lower energy source, it gets absorbed some energy. All of a sudden, it just pops up and appears at a higher energy source, and we can't trace its path. We don't know how it got there. We can't follow it. It doesn't go just 1 to 2 to 3 to 4 to 5. It could go from 1, bam, 6, it's there, and we don't even know how it got there. Okay? And the, and the opposite could be true. It could reappear at a lower interval. Where does it go? What well, controls it? It's craziness. Okay? <clears throat> Chaos. All right. Now, when the electron leaps from a higher energy orbit, this is a whole quantum leap thing, right? He just appears and then reappears somewhere else. And that's, that's the whole premise of the title. Uh, when the electron leaps from a higher energy orbit to one that is closer to the nucleus, energy is emitted from the atom as a photon of light, a little particle of energy, a little particle of wavelengths that is, we don't, it's not really a particle, right? It's just a little packet of a, a group of wavelengths that gets emitted, and they are uh, attributed to a certain wavelength that are thus a certain color. Okay? And what's really cool is that um, some, what most atoms tend to do is, of course, I said emit light, light wavelengths, things that we can see. Realize that some things like a glow-in-the-dark kind of stuff, um, all the, the way all that works, some things have the ability to absorb wavelengths that are much longer than the wavelengths that we can see. And they can absorb big, you know, they can absorb short wave, things that are really short that have a lot of energy, or they can absorb things that are longer that have less energy. Point being, what comes into the atom is not always what comes out of the atom. Okay? You can take a, like a really, really short wavelength energy and supply a whole lot of energy to an atom, and we don't see that wavelength coming in. It's just radiation that's in the atmosphere. It's getting absorbed by these atoms. All of a sudden, when that hits those atoms, they, get, they bounce up to a higher energy orbit, and the second they do that, they become instable, and that electron falls back down. And when it does, it releases photons of light that all of a sudden now are visible. It came from a thing that was an invisible. Now it's visible. Okay? Now when your kids ask, I'm gonna, I'll, I'll leave you with this. Okay? When your kids ask, why is the sky blue? Why is the ocean blue? No, there, I'm not saying they didn't. I'm just saying there's a chemical explanation for this. Okay? <clears throat> there's, a, there's a reason. The water molecules, the oxygen in particular, they, they like to emit certain wavelengths of light. They like to absorb energy. They like to re, re, let out and, and emit certain wavelengths of energy that correspond to the blue end of the spectrum. Okay? All right.